Good afternoon. Welcome to West Texas A&M University, and welcome to one of the finest institutions in the state of Texas. My name is Sayyid Tariq Anwar. I am a professor at uh, WT. We call it WT. This is our uh, second seminar. We started this series about uh, two semesters ago. And so what we do is uh, AI, which is called artificial intelligence, has become very big. And it has multiple areas, multiple issues, many problems, but many advantages also. So that is the whole purpose. Before I uh, invite our uh, first speaker, Professor Dave Rausch, uh, let me tell you uh, why we are doing it. This is done in conjunction with American Marketing Association, which is like 35,000 people, 35,000 members worldwide. And they have like 300 chapters nationwide. We are one of the best chapters in the region. So we have done a lot of things, and uh, it's good for the university. But thanks so much for coming. And uh, please uh, do take your notes, because we will have a Q&A. &A. And uh, at this time, I would like to invite Professor Dave Rausch. You have seen him on our local TV and beyond. He's a well-known personality. And he's very popular among the political scientists. And uh, he's in demand everywhere, uh, Austin, as well as Canyon and Amarillo. So let's give a warm welcome to our friend, Mr. Dave Rausch. After an introduction like that, I always feel like I should be singing or something, uh, which you don't want. Of course, I forgot to remember how to turn this off so I can turn mine on. Uh, political science, here we go. So, starting up this uh, slideshow from beginning. So, uh, I don't know how popular I am among a political scientists. Uh, I know I'm not very popular among some members of Congress, but because uh, they write me nasty letters. The, uh, I have a folder. The, uh, the issue uh, there is that you know, I'm not a big fan of term limits, and they are, so uh, I tend to you know, rebel in the wrong way. But I thought today we'd take a look at a tiny subject, uh, political science, politics, and artificial intelligence. Uh, and there's my title and all that stuff. Uh, just to give you a little context, Rausch is a German word. I, um, I have German descent. And uh, Rausch is actually the German word for drunk. No one ever remembers my last name, but they always remember Dr. Drunk. I never quite understood that. But anyway, so let's take a look here. Artificial intelligence. So imagine Will Rogers. I went to graduate school at the University of Oklahoma. I'm a big fan of Will Rogers. Uh, if Congress had artificial intelligence, it might produce better laws than it does with real intelligence. Let that one sink in for a minute. That's an insult. Will Rogers is very good at that. Uh, what was his favorite? One of his famous lines was... Uh, if I talk about Congress and I talk about the criminal class, oh, I repeat myself. Boy, you guys are tired after lunch. <laughs> so, if Congress had artificial intelligence, it might produce better laws than it does with real intelligence. So we're going to take a look at a couple of things. I tend to divide up politics and government as being different. Uh, infuriates definitely my 2306 students, the state and local government students, because they see politics and government as the same thing. And I hate it. Uh, I'm probably teach one of the few classes on campus, where, other than math, where people don't hate it before they actually even start it. I hate government. And I was like, okay, I kind of like it. Uh, my dad was a politician, never won anything. But, uh, but I'm going to take a look at AI and government. So there is a difference. That might be an interesting exercise. Ask something like uh, and a bot like ChatGDP, what's the difference between government and politics? Surprisingly, yesterday when I was playing around with ChatGDP, I did not do that. I hadn't thought about that. I only made that suggestion. I didn't actually do it. So. And then we're going to take a look at AI and political science. So political science, in a sense, is a study of both politics and government. Uh, I have this argument with local and not so local community college folks who want us to call our classes you know, Government 2306. And I always tell them, I teach bigger than government. I teach about politics and stuff. So uh, they don't quite get it most of the time. Most of them are history anyway, so it doesn't, uh, doesn't really impact them in any way. So just for some fun, I asked ChatGTP some things, and it produced something. And we'll take a look at those, hopefully. Uh, this morning when I tried to practice, uh, <laughs> ChatGTP was down. Uh, <laughs> it's funny. Uh, 
you're trying to do something on ChatGTP and it's actually not working. So, so we're going to take a look at what's some of the differences between artificial intelligence and then real intelligence or reality intelligence. Well, most of you probably don't remember uh, Senator Joe Biden running for president in 1987. Those in your room who do remember Senator Joe Biden running, uh, it's a small group probably. In 1987, he ran for president. Uh, and he had a tiny little mistake that he made. And I, of course, am not getting my notes on here. I actually copied my notes. Uh, Neil Kinnock, at the time, was the Labor Party leader in, in Great Britain. And what happened was, in a 1987 debate, uh, candidate Biden, Senator Biden, uh, quoted Neil Kinnock without actually saying, that's something that Neil Kinnock would say. So he, he cited him without actually, you know, he quoted him without actually citing him. Where did I get that? So it made it sound like that was a Joe Biden statement, not a Neil Kinnock statement. And the media picked up on it. I thought it was very interesting. Now, I asked that question. Um, I actually have my notes down here somewhere. So there was a, uh, an interesting, uh, Maureen Dowd of the New York Times wrote that American, political, uh, American presidential campaign strategists admired the way it portrayed Kinnock as a man of character. And Senator Joseph Biden was really interested in this movie, so he became quite the Kinnock fan. Uh, the problem was, uh, Kinnock, well, he made this, uh, there was this debate in Iowa. The first caucus in the presidential campaign is in Iowa, uh, traditionally has been in Iowa. And so they had a debate, uh, does it say up here who the debate was? Oh, Michael Dukakis, Jesse Jackson, Al Gore, and others. And so uh, he basically just, in his regular prepared statement, mentioned Kinnock without actually mentioning his name. And so uh, after, the, after the debate, when uh, the, the presidential candidate sat down, uh, one of uh, Biden's aides told him, uh, Psst, you forgot to credit Kinnock. I won't say what he said. Uh, in his hurry, he had failed to squeeze in the usual accreditation. He had to drop out. What I was trying to find this morning, and I, I guess this is it, uh, the Dukakis campaign made sure the, camp, the media got to know about it. So that's a good question. Uh, let's say somebody today uh, actually runs a, uh, an ad that's created by artificial intelligence. So they call it misinformation. Aren't there lots of journalists out there you know, rummaging around trying to find stories, dig them out and stuff? No, not really. Uh, uh, I've been working on a little research project looking at uh, governmental structure created in the early 1970s. And just about every issue of the Canyon News has a long article about debates that went on in the, in the Randall County Commission, the Potter County Commissioner's Court, all those types of things. Today, if you open up the Canyon News, I know more about Lubbock in the Canyon News than I do about Canyon. Oh, which is why a lot of people ask, why do you still subscribe to the Canyon News? Because occasionally, like last week, there's a great article about all the debate of replacing Paul Blake on the Canyon School Board. Am I the only person interested in that stuff? Uh, maybe. So why does this matter? There was this great uh, story recently about how the DeSantis campaign faked some pictures of... Uh, Anthony Fauci, you might remember him as everyone's favorite doctor from the COVID year-ish. They showed pictures of him hugging Donald Trump. And why would DeSantis run these, these ads? Well, it makes Trump look bad. <laughs> He'd do pretty good by himself. Uh, oop, that's recorded. <laughs> I'll disappear next week probably, but anyway, who cares? Uh, there they are. That's all artificial intelligence. Aww. It, there's a bunch of them. We can run through all of them. There's one. There's one. There's another one. Now, what's interesting about this is uh, the three images of Trump and Fauci kissing and hugging are likely AI generated. Likely. <laughs> That's like saying, when it rains, I'll get wet. Uh, likely, it's likely I'll get wet if I'm outside when it rains. Likely. Uh, so uh, I thought that was particularly interesting. Uh, widely accessible artificial intelligence tools could fuel the rampant spread of disinformation and create other hazards to democracy. Those pictures of Trump and Fauci, who would believe that? Would any normal reading American believe that? 
You wouldn't believe it. <laughs> I bet I could pass it around campus and I get, well, that's what I've always thought. I thought they were both gay lovers. Not going there. But couldn't you also use AI then to find AI? Uh, we've actually been uh, looking at that in, as professors. You know, if a student uses AI to write a paper, can't we just feed it through AI to find where it is? Uh, in the good old days, last week, I, uh, I use Google. So if I'm reading a paper and there's something that doesn't really sound student-like, I take that sentence and I plug it into Google and I find it. Uh, nine and a half times out of 10. It's that one half a time I just gave up and decided to go to bed. So, uh, there's actually a journalism program. I feel like I'm advertising everybody else's school here. This is at the, uh, I think it's the London School of Economics. London School of Economics and Political Science. They actually have a, a program called Journalism AI, which actually will teach journalists how to use AI for good, uh, both in ferreting out information. When I was in high school, I always wanted to be like an investigative journalist. I grew up with uh, Woodward and Bernstein. I thought I was more Bernstein than I was Woodward. I can never dress like Woodward. Uh, he looks too much like Robert Redford. I don't know. I don't know why that is. Is that a really old <laughs> popular culture reference I just stopped using? So uh, in political science, we have this thing called model legislation. And model legislation isn't all that bad. Um, there are some groups out there that, that give you, you know, give members of the state legislature legislation. That's their job. They're lobbyists. And uh, in, in some cases, these bills look identical. So it could be introduced in Arkansas, Texas, uh, Colorado, probably not, but uh, Kansas, maybe. And you see these bills and they're all the same. And there's been a lot of criticism of that. So is that any worse than having the Texas leg legislature introduce a bill written by AI? Hmm. I should probably turn off my dingy phone. Uh, the one bill that sticks in my mind is this year, I don't, those of you who may not follow the Texas Constitution like I do, uh, we are voting on a constitutional right to farm. The, the Texas legislature has decided that we need to determine, put agricultural practices into the Constitution. And I think there's like four other states in the last 10 years that have voted on this. And I think ours is actually bigger because ours also includes uh, timber harvesting and something else, timber harvesting. And maybe, maybe it actually just says food production in there too. Uh, so things like uh, meatpacking plants and stuff. Uh, are there any family run meatpacking plants? I think with that, meatpacking plants tend to be big industrial type of things. You don't just have a, an outbuilding where you, when I grew up, we did, but oh, it's our little butcher house. One of the things I tried to do, and let me see if I can, I am not the most efficient or effective on switching screens here, but I'm going to switch back to my, did I do it on Bard? No, I think I did it on, whoops. Oh, chat GTP. Uh, thank you. So I did a, uh, a little study where I compared those two. Oklahoma actually voted on constitutional right to farm. That, any of you are familiar with Oklahoma? Have you ever been to Oklahoma? It kind of looks like Texas, only a little bit further north. Uh, I went to graduate school at the University of Oklahoma. So I still do a lot of research on Oklahoma. Uh, they actually voted on a constitutional right to farm. Did it pass? Think about it for a minute. Did it pass? I wouldn't be asking you if it did, by the way. Uh, I'm showing my hand here. It failed in Oklahoma. So I spent the last two or three weeks digging up all sorts of data and stuff to try to figure out why it failed. Uh, by the way, it failed because of water. Uh, there's parts of Oklahoma that actually have water. That's what makes Oklahoma different than Texas. Uh, Oklahoma has some water, like lakes and stuff, Lake Dirty Bird in Norman. Uh, when I looked it up on ChatGTP, I wanted to compare. It doesn't know anything because I'm using the cheap version. I'm, I'm not a, well, I guess I could have someone else pay for it, but I'm not a big fan of paying for stuff. So uh, they only looked up at stuff since September 2021, or not since, up to September 2021. So that's the nice thing about my classes. Uh, when I teach my classes, most of my assignments are more recent type of things, like go to a local government meeting. And you can't have it look up a local government meeting from this semester because it's this semester, 2023. So uh, 
I did that. I also did it on Bard. Uh, and Bard was kind of funny. Bard's a, uh, is Google's version, uh, Google Alphabet's version. Uh, Texas Proposition 1, 2023 in Oklahoma State, question 777. Interesting. It thought these were marijuana legislation. I'm trying to remember. Marijuana, I think, was 820, uh, state question 820 in Oklahoma. You might remember to Oklahoma. Uh, in 2018, Oklahoma, 2018? Yes, 2018, Oklahoma uh, allowed for medical marijuana. So you, you know, if you get a doctor's note, you can actually smoke marijuana in Oklahoma. You can buy it. Uh, though that was very interesting that it thought those two were, and it even talked about, you know, Texas, limited possession of marijuana. Huh? Uh, so I, I actually did it backwards then. I gave it a little bit of help by asking well, what is state question 777, and then it's the, that talked about it correctly. The measure was defeated by a vote of 60 to 40, and there's, this one actually gives you a citation, Wikipedia. Don't you like when the web cites itself, essentially, uh, Wikipedia? Uh, Oklahoma State Question 777 are both right to farm amendments. Now it got it right. Since I told it what it was by having it look up what it was, it actually got it right. So this is very interesting. Uh, and uh, so it looks like Texas is actually a little bit bigger. Uh, Texas has established a process for determining whether a state law has a compelling state interest. So, things I do with my free time. Actually, that's not really my free time. That's part of my research. Uh, in the process of preparing this, I found a thing called prompt engineering. There's actually a process. You can get a certificate in this. How to write the prompts to get the best stuff out of ChatGTP and BARD. Oh. Now again, I did a chat search. Oh, what schools might be offering said certificates? Well, since 2021, uh, there's been a bunch that have added. Uh, UT Austin has a program. UT Dallas has a program. I don't think tech has a program. Uh, there's a bunch of Texas schools, uh, Harvard, Yale, uh, have programs on how to do, how to write those prompts, you know, how to write the things in there to get the answer you want. Uh, and then it's a science. I try to explain that to students. So if, you know, if you're a member of the state legislature, are you going to spend a lot of time sitting there trying to figure out how to get it to write a bill you want it to look like, or are you just going to ask a lobbyist? The student way of doing it is, well, you just look, look it up on Google just as fast. Uh, the only difference is it doesn't write it for you. You have to take the stuff you find on Google and put it in like sentence form. You can't say, oh, Dr. Roush, this is Google pay, you know, Google search, blah, 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 Google search, blah, 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 type of thing. So, uh, there's actually a prompt engineering guide. So if you want to learn how to do prompt engineering, just go to, <laughs> go to Google <laughs> and type in prompt engineering guide. Uh, and the guys who wrote that or the people who wrote that, first of all, the guide is copyright 2023. So it's not going to show up in ChatGTP, uh, but uh, or at least the, the, the cheap version. And so, uh, so now, uh, one of the things I've been discussing with my, my, uh, my wife, who's a librarian uh, over in Cornette, is uh, so if I find this great document on how the uh, Portuguese parliament works, can I feed that through ChatGTP and have it translate it back to English? And so my wife right now is cranking through what would be the copyright violations that I would violate there, and would I ever be allowed to visit Portugal? <laughs> I, my dad loves Lisbon. I, I have no idea why, but uh, my, my dad doesn't even speak Spanish, much less Portuguese. So. Like a good student, since Dr. Anwar only gave this to me uh, two days ago, uh, I typed his questions in to chat GTP, and I got some answers. We'll look at those in a minute. Uh, but one of the interesting things is I just had it search for ethics, AI, and political campaigns. Is it ethical to use AI in your political campaign? Now, there are different, uh, different things. I hate switching back and forth here, but I'm going to do it anyway. Whoops, wrong way. Uh, chat GTP. So I, uh, I also got an itinerary if you want to visit Liechtenstein. Uh, there's my homily for next week. Here it is. Uh, <laughs> did, I, did I have ChatGTP write my homily for church? Probably. Uh, so I found out that uh, AI is a growing and significant role in the field of political science. Doesn't it make you want to stand up and put your hand over your heart when you read that? You know, it, it's written in such dramatic... Uh, so data analysis and prediction. Cool. 
Now I don't have to teach my class how to use R anymore because uh, everybody just strangle me anyway uh, on R. R is a programming language. Uh, we use SPSS. I usually use SPSS, but I decided this year since R is free that it would be beneficial to the students to use free stuff. I'm learning otherwise. Uh, but it does data analysis and prediction. So I'm trying to figure out if I plug in that spreadsheet that I created on Oklahoma, will it give me the answer? What caused state question 777 to lose? I didn't have a chance to try this morning because I'm still putting data in the spreadsheet. But, uh, social media analysis, that's something I've been trying to look at too. Uh, is, for example, Twitter unfair to female candidates? That's always been sort of an interesting thing to look at is Facebook. Facebook. So the things you find on Facebook about female candidates, is that much more unfair than it is uh, male candidates? Maybe sort of interesting to look at. Policy analysis, campaign strategy. Uh, when I uh, graduated from, when I finished my master's at OU, my dad actually gave me his notebook of how to run a campaign. Now, there are two things I learned from that. One is his handwriting is worse than mine. So I had to sit there and translate it into regular Roush English. And so, uh, but what's interesting about that is, uh, it really all it is is talk to people. Uh, when my dad would run for office, that's how he would you know, campaign. He would talk to people. Uh, probably the biggest office he ever ran for was the Pennsylvania House, uh, House of Representatives. And he was so good at it, he ran four times and still lost all four times. Uh, but then I decided I want to be a political science major. That's what encouraged me. Uh, largely because my dad would dump me off at the areas that were strongly in favor of his opponent. And so they'd throw bricks and stuff at me. And I always thought of politics as something you have to learn how to duck and run and stuff. But, uh, governance and decision making. Public opinion polling. You can actually have AI do your public opinion polling for you. I usually get students and I pay them poorly uh, to call 300 people. Uh, doesn't that sound enticing? Hey, I want to go sign up for that. <laughs> uh, and you always call them right about when they're making dinner. That's the best time to call someone for a political public opinion poll. Uh, that's when everybody calls me. And all oh, this poll will only take 15 minutes. When you're calling me, though, it usually takes about an hour and a half. Because first of all, I want them to repeat the question a couple of times because as they're talking, I'm writing it down. Because uh, that might be a good question to use later. And I can do that without chat GDP. Network analysis. So these are the things that it found for me. But how about, uh, I also had a student who was, had a problem with his R program, why the file too large? I don't know why I plugged that in there. I should probably delete that one. What is the role of artificial intelligence in Congress? So I thought specific. I, I study Congress. That's my big deal. Uh, and so it does the same things. Policy analysis, uh, legislative research. So is it going to get rid of all those staffers who now do that? Well, I think about the typical member of Congress has to have someone in his or her staff that can speak typical member of Congress. And so they'll take what they find through chat GTP and translate it into member of Congress speak. So you still have to have someone. That's what I saw the other day on, it was in between all the fentanyl ads, uh, was a new story or something on, uh, uh, you're not going to be replaced by AI, you're going to be replaced by someone who knows how to use AI. So. Uh, I was going to start, and I thought about this coming up the steps, that I'm actually a tortured soul. I like learning lots of new stuff. I like learning, you know, knowing how to do things that everybody else knows how to do. But I'm also probably the most lazy person you've ever met. Uh, I hate working. So I became a professor. Uh, <laughs> and political science, where you're talking about not working. Uh, but that's the, that's the interesting thing. Uh, legislative research. Uh, I did that the other day. What did I, where did I do that? Uh, Talk about data analysis, Texas Constitution, partisan realignment. That was kind of interesting. Uh, oh, I've been trying to research this guy named Fletcher Sims, trying to see who's in there. Uh, but that's not the good one. The good one was yesterday afternoon, I decided to, I do research on term limits, as I already pointed out. This is one of the things I always think is interesting. So uh, I ask it something about term limits, and then I always ask it for its sources. Uh, Bard's a little bit more clever about how it presents it. ChatGTP just says, I don't know, go look here. I'm like, well, you're making me work. I thought this was supposed to be a shortcut. Uh, but the nice thing is, you know, the Heritage Foundation, term limits, the only way to clean up Congress, not a terribly good book. Uh, 
U.S. term limits, the K Street, uh, I know all those guys on K Street, uh, NORC surveys and stuff. And then, of course, I, um, somewhere on here, Bard was my favorite yesterday. Why was Bard my favorite? I was looking for local governments, uh, and I asked it something about what do I teach, and it told me, but where did it tell me that? Oh, here it is. What does Dr. Dave Roush teach? So I teach courses primarily in the area of American politics, political institutions, and religion and politics. Very good, uh, because it took it from my biography that's on the university website. So I knew where that was coming from. The thing that got me and actually had me tear up a little bit was that Dr. Roush is a highly respected professor, and his courses are known for being challenging and engaging. <laughs> you haven't read my evaluations. Uh, he is passionate about teaching his students about American government and politics, and is committed to helping them develop their critical thinking and analytical skills. I had to get out of Kleenex. Uh, I never sounded so good. But it will not tell me where it found it. <laughs> I'm kind of curious who else said that. Uh, I was talking to uh, the WT class folks, and they were thinking, see, notice I put that as a question. What is the source of this? Dr. Rash is highly respected. Uh, I apologize for my previous response. It's very polite. Uh, I do not have any reliable support sources to support the claim that Dr. Roush is a highly respected, uh, because there probably aren't any. But uh, I have a feeling I gave a presentation or something at a, like the Excel one time, or I spoke to the Lions Club or something, and someone may have written it down and put it in a newspaper or something. Uh, I don't think it's on the back of one of the books that I, I have a, a chapter in. But, uh, and then just for fun, I decided to ask, uh, as Dr. Anwar pointed out, what, uh, what is political science? Since most people don't know, we actually have a whole class on that, Introduction to Political Science. Uh, so I'm not getting the two sign yet, so apparently I must be rolling all. Oh, I got the two sign. <laughs> don't ask for it. Uh, so we're just going to quickly then go through all the rest of my 500 slides here. Uh, there's an author in the Time magazine who pointed out that contemporary AI systems are now becoming human competitive of general tasks. Should we let machines flood our information channels with propaganda and untruth? This is one of those places where you want to sit down, cross your legs, and go, what is truth? Hmm. Uh, and so I'm going to see if I can close with this. I don't know. Uh, when I was a, that's nice to know. Uh, is I'm actually on YouTube? No? Oh, it does say browse YouTube. It's going to bring up all sorts of weird stuff, so I apologize for that. Weird science. Science. So weird science. Uh, you might be familiar with this movie. It's the classic Val Kilmer production where he's like a very... Thriven has helped me to develop the tools that I use. I'm getting kind of tired of the Thriven ad, too. There we go. Typical college classroom. Student anxiously writing stuff down. Oh, look, their tape recorder is replacing. So not only is the class tape recording everything, the lecture is actually coming in on a tape recording. So is this the future with, uh, or is it future of political science? When I go to a political science meeting, am I just going to see uh, other people with tape recorders uh, presenting their stuff? No. Is there, a future, is there a future for political science? I guess it would probably be the deeper question. I don't know. I certainly hope so, at least another 20 years of future. Uh, after that, it's, it's a, everyone's ball game. But, so thank you very much. Okay, our next speaker is Mr. Uh, Daniel Klein. And uh, you have seen his name and you have seen him upstairs. Uh, he's director of uh, writing center and also teaches uh, English. So welcome, uh, Mr. Klein. Hello, everybody. All right, so my job 
basically requires that I look at words all the time. And ChatGPT and I became best friends last spring. We got to talk all the time, look at all the words. I'm not going to bore you with our conversations today, but what I did want to talk about is what's actually happening currently in the field of writing and literature when it comes to AI. So the first thing is, how many of you have used something like Grammarly? Yeah. I'm just going to shake my head and pretend like that's cool, right? Um, all of you have been using or introduced to AI. How many of you have typed something on your phone and all of a sudden the word is jumping out before you finish typing it? And you're like, that's a pretty good word. I'll use that one. Yep, you're using AI. So we already use it all the time in what we do, right? It's that, it's that predictive text. It's coming up with new words. It's whatever. Um, I still like to advocate for the human aspect of teaching writing because story time, we have students that will come down to the writing center and they're struggling to come up with a paragraph, they're trying to come up with an idea. We'll get them brainstorming, we'll leave them alone for a couple of minutes, we come back and they have this beautifully written paragraph. We'll say, what inspired you to write that? And they're like, uh, just, it just came to me. And then we'll ask them, what does it mean? And they'll say, I, I, I don't know. And we're like, we, did you write it? Well, no. Okay. Do you see the problem? The disconnect, right? You can have AI give you information, but if you don't understand the information, then you're not going to be able to articulate that to somebody else. So we're already using AI for things like Grammarly and stuff. Um, there's very much cases in the United States where AI is replacing human instruction. Um, how many of you would like to be taught by a robot? How many of you probably have been taught by a robot? It's scary, right? You think that you're actually talking to a human and you find out that it's actually an artificial intelligence um, speaking to you or, or interacting with you. So this is already happening. Um, the question that you would have to ask yourself is which would you rely more on, the human or the artificial intelligence? And I'm not going to open it up to questions yet. This is just like a reflective question. But artificial intelligence couldn't ask you what I just asked you. Does that make sense? Um, it would expect some kind of programmed response from you. Whereas I can read your faces those of you that are still with me up here. I can read your faces and I know humanly, okay, this is what's going on, this, this, this. Chat GPT. Now, like I said, we're good friends, Chat GPT and I. And one way that I will actually encourage students to use Chat GPT is to help with things like outlining and planning for documents. So let me ask you this, show of hands, how many of you have used ChatGPT to outline a paper? Look at, the, look at the proud rays of the four of you. How many of you are scared I'll judge you forever? How many of you, okay, I'll, I'll close my eyes when I ask this question. How many of you have used ChatGPT to produce a document? Okay. I don't know any of you, so that's cool. Um, how many of you have been tempted to use ChatGPT to come? All right, there we go. There's something good. All right. Let me just give you some advice on ChatGPT with papers. Um, ChatGPT is a liar. Okay? We've, we've proven that. We've looked at some of this. It will make up its own sources. It will make up its own information. Um, if you were with us in the first seminar, I asked ChatGPT to write a, a, a soliloquy for me using Shakespeare as the inspiration, and it literally plagiarized Hamlet's to be or not to be speech. And I called it out, I said, you plagiarized, and ChatGPT said, no, no, this is my work. It's a liar, okay? So be careful allowing ChatGPT that much control over your grade and what you're saying. Um, I occasionally teach a class on Batman, and I asked ChatGPT to help me with a paper on Batman, and it lied to me. It had the wrong 
villain had the Riddler instead of the Joker, which is just a big, big, big no-no. Everybody knows the Riddler and the Joker are not the same people. Well, except ChatGPT. I was a little confused on that. Um, so outlining and planning. Again, with caution. So I teach technical writing. That's my primary class. And right now, my students are producing a um, proposal memo for a proposal project that will consume the majority of their semester. I fed my assignment sheet into ChatGPT, and I asked it to help me create an outline for this memo. It did, but it did a very interesting thing. It created letter format followed by memo format almost, almost with an email feel to it. So it, it got really confused when I fed it the assignment sheet on exactly what it should do to create this document. In my class, I built the actual outline for the memo in, in front of my students, at which point they simply copied it down from the screen. What's the difference, right? That's what a lot of people say is like, as instructors, we're having students mimic what we do on the screen. What's that, how's that different than what ChatGPT does? It's a simple answer. Who's grading the work? I am. So if I give a specific expectation of an assignment, ChatGPT cannot replicate that specific expectation. For the future, you might want to get used to seeing more unique assignments like that coming your way because they can't be just easily replicated by artificial intelligence. Right, so something to think about. Um, AI does the repetitive things very well. So mention writing legislation or writing, um, you know, procedurals. One of my favorite assignments in my tech comm class is to ask my students to write the instructions for making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Do you think ChatGPT could handle those instructions? It could. Would a human be able to follow those instructions? Sure. What if you have a human who's never made a peanut butter and jelly sandwich before? Do you see where the disconnect would come in? Because chat GPT would probably say something like, take two slices of bread, get some peanut butter, get some jelly, get a knife, spread the peanut butter on one piece of bread, spread the jelly on another piece of bread. What do you think the human would ask? How do you open the peanut butter? How do you open the bread? Have you thought about that one? What kind of instructions would you give to a human who's never made a peanut butter and jelly sandwich when it comes to opening the bread? How many of you are thinking twisty tie? How many of you are thinking plastic? Which two pieces of bread, by the way? Do you see how these, these are human interaction questions and a lot of times, ChatGPT and AI in, in general will just have this baseline assumption that you know all of this information. Do you see the difference in those two? But when it comes to the repetitive things, AI can usually handle that pretty well, procedurals and stuff. And right now, AI is already replacing humans. Um, for example, journalism is actually leaning on AI to write its articles. Is that scary or what? Um, or is that awesome or what? I don't know. Depends on your perspective of that. But AI is actually using, or uh, companies are using AI to replace human workforces, especially in the areas of journalism. The New York Times actually has articles that have been written completely by artificial intelligence. There are some drawbacks to that, I think. Um, you lose the quote-unquote human element whenever you start producing an article like that, right? You kind of lose that, that human connection. Um, and then, of course, who determines what stories are important? Imagine artificial intelligence picking the stories that we are going to read. It's a little complicated, right? So I went out into the interwebs, and I found this really, really cool article, a very timely article, 
um, just recently published. Let's just open it up so I can show you how awesome this article is. Um, you're looking at, it was accepted the 3rd of August, 2023. That's how recent this article is. And what these authors did was they basically researched the number of people and hits that have been researched on artificial intelligence. So when you read through this and you start getting into, um, let me get down to the cool charts. In the area of medicine, for example, there are more people researching the use of artificial intelligence in the area of medicine than in any of these other disciplines. It's fascinating. Look at the country that is doing most of the research when it comes to using artificial intelligence. The question is why, right? Why, um, why is the United States winning this idea of using artificial intelligence? What's going on there? Um, This is just a fascinating article. And then, as you continue, um, there are some other tables, but basically, just look at the, the um, content of some of these. Documents reviewed based on journals, titles, and citations. So look at the first one. So uh, the one I have highlighted here. So what if ChatGPT wrote it? Multidisciplinary perspectives on opportunities, challenge, and implications of generative conversational AI for research, practice, and policy. Since June, this particular article has been cited 89 times in other works. I mean, this is a growing field where people are really diving in and trying to understand what's going on with this. Um, five priorities for research cited 234 times dealing with artificial intelligence. Is ChatGPT a valid author? Since June, and this was approved in August, since they ran their, um, their data, nine different citations on that. <coughs> Findings of syst uh, systematic review of selected documents. So look what I have highlighted here, writing assistant uh, research tool. Is it important for educators to model responsible use of ChatGPT, prioritize critical thinking, and be clear about expectations? ChatGPT is likely to be a useful tool for educators designing science units, rubrics, and quizzes. This is from digital technologies and STEM research. But then you have another one, a wake-up call to university staff to think very carefully about the design of their assessments and ways to ensure that academic dishonesty is clearly explained to students and minimized. How many of you in your classes so far this semester, have had somebody talk to you about plagiarism and AI? How many of you have had a class that has supported the use of AI? How many of you have had a class that's absolutely against the use of AI? How many of you are scared to do the wrong thing in the wrong class, <laughs> right? There's, you know, like, okay, which class was it that I could use AI? Which class was it that I couldn't use AI? Um, these are real questions that we have to face as we start moving forward and as you start moving forward in your education. How many of you will have careers where you have to produce documents? Some kind of document, a memo, a letter, proposal, report, email. Now the hands are gonna start going up, right? Um, how confident do you feel in producing your own work with that? That's the question. As you're going through school right now, it's okay to be familiar with AI, but you also have to work on the critical thinking aspect of what do I do whenever I have to produce this document? What's valid, what's not, what's important, what's not? So that's something that we as in university, we as instructors, we in academia have to prepare you guys for and actually make you familiar with what can I do, how can I think, and, and what, what does it matter. 
Um, notice this highlighted area here. AI is already used in medicine, especially in image and, and analysis, but the domains are infinite, and it is possible that AI could quickly help or replace rheumatologists in the writing of scientific articles. This is in medicine, and they're already saying that AI could replace the people that are actually practicing the medicine when it comes to writing the articles. Recently, um, I read an article, because it hits close to home, I have a daughter with medical needs, and I read an article that these parents were taking their child to a variety of different doctors to try to get a diagnosis. None of the doctors could figure it out. So the parents turned to AI, ChatGPT, typed in the symptoms, and said, what could this possibly be? And it immediately returned a diagnosis. They contacted the doctors and said, what about this? It was tethered cord syndrome. What about this? And the doctors just went, oh yeah, we didn't think about that. So that's a, that's a benefit, right? It's a checks and balances system. But AI is not going to treat the, the tethered cord syndrome. But AI found it, and now the doctors can make a plan to treat it. So we can work together with AI, right? I'm not saying that it should just go away, but I'm saying be cautious. Um, so what lies ahead when we're dealing with AI-related issues? Number one, we have the AI writer. Who's making all the words, right? Do you guys understand how ChatGPT produces its information? Basically what happens is it's fed. So the more times we ask it questions, the more it builds this library of information. Um, there's all kinds of mathematical stuff involved with this, but just understand that they fed it multiple, multiple combinations of words and concepts. So those already exist as a baseline. And every time we communicate with ChatGPT, that repertoire grows. So now, if we ask it questions about tethered cord syndrome, it's pulling in all of this new information to address and answer to that. Now, there's the paid and the non-paid, right? Um, the paid version is like 20 bucks a month, so you can choose Netflix or you know, talk to chat, GPT, whatever, whatever you do, whatever. You. Or you can go free. The free is not as up to date, but you have an AI writer. So the question is, who's, who's actually writing this? Well, it's just putting together all these different phrases that exist to create content. We also have this idea of automation versus creativity. How many of you have a favorite author? And you probably have a reason why you like that favorite author, right? The writing style or the wit or the humor or the stories. AI can write books. You can ask ChatGPT to write you a short story and it will. It'll produce one nicely for you. But can it, can it hit the creativity of it? That's, that's where we're starting to like see AI actually grow. Is it starting to learn how to be creative and to be deceptive with that? So you may be reading a Stephen King book that wasn't written by Stephen King. You may be watching a movie with Bruce Willis in it that's not Bruce Willis. You know the Hollywood strike, the writer strike that's going on right now? It's that, automation versus creativity. The reason your TV shows aren't on right now is because the writers in Hollywood are like, we want to get paid. And some of the studios are like, yeah, but we can use AI to write the TV shows. So that's, that's down the pipe. That's coming up in the future. Um, AI and emotion. AI doesn't have feelings. Unless it gets really creepy and starts like, that happened, but that's beside the point. Um, AI doesn't have emotions, nor can it tell emotions. So watch out for those. Also, accuracy. Again, AI has been busted on several occasions just making up references that don't exist. They're nowhere to be found. They just created them. And of course, I, as a writing instructor, someone that works in, in the field of words, 
am just sitting back very happily waiting to see what happens next with this one. <clears throat> Ethically, who owns the writing? So if I ask AI to produce a document for me, a, a research paper for my class, and I submit that as my work, ethically, it's not my work. It doesn't belong to me. It's not something I came up with. And then, of course, legally, who owns the work? That's going to be another issue. Um, anybody have favorite artist, a musical artist? Yeah? That's starting to become a legal battle now, is that people are using AI to recreate artists' sounds and styles. So there's this idea of authenticity, right? So these last two bullets, I'm, I'm like one of those people that, you know, like the football game, the spectator. I can't wait to see what happens in the legal courts whenever more of this stuff starts getting produced. Um, if I need to create an owner's manual for a product and I use AI to do it, I've saved my business money. But now the question is legally, who's responsible if AI gives bad information? The company will be responsible because they used AI to do that. But they can't recoup their costs because who do you sue? A robot? It's going to be really fun to watch. That's why I'm all excited. Like, Terminator's on its way. It's so cool. Um, a long, long time ago, when I was in school, they always told us that we shouldn't learn, or we should learn math and not use our calculators. And there's going to be a day when we don't have a calculator and we can't use it, and whatever. I don't remember what they said. I wasn't paying attention. But this thing is amazing. It has like calculators and the internet and everything built into it right there, right? But I still have to know how to use it. I still have to know which numbers to plug in, how to get the formula, how to get the, the correct answer. I can't just make it up. So that's my advice to you all as you start tackling AI is know how to use it. Critical thinking and how does it apply. Um, there's the word cited. Again, if you want to read that article, some really, really good information on there, um, I would highly suggest it. And it's brand new, hot off the presses. Thank you. I will wrap up this session, and uh, I'll show you a few things which came out in the last uh, six, seven months. This is Wall Street Journal, and uh, Salesforce.com, you know, ran this ad, and it says, if AI is the Wild West, who is the sheriff? That is the problem. This just showed up a few days ago, Financial Times, the global race to set the rules for AI. Countries are fighting, not people, okay? And this is a Bloomberg Business Week, and AI already made it to Hollywood. This is from Chronicle of Higher Education, and a few months back, they said Chad GPT can already pass freshman year at Harvard. Think about it. This is Bloomberg, and that is computer, OK. This is Economist, AI voted in your area. So sky is the limit, so much going on. But I will share some data with you, because you, uh, they have some excellent comments. But we need to know what's happening in the world. Uh, AI is uh, intelligent machines, intelligent computer program, algorithms, machine learning. We all know that. Market size, $100 billion. But this is mind-boggling. By 2032, it's going to go to $1 trillion. Think about it. Now, this is not my data. I got it from Goldman Sachs, Bloomberg, US Department of Commerce, World Bank. I have lots of agencies. And if you are interested, I'll be happy to share that with you. And the whole thing is uh, it's uh, going at the speed of uh, light very fast. Uh, it will increase your GDP by 7%. $1 trillion will be added to the global economy. And your global economy is $95 trillion, very big. How big the population is? 8.1 billion. So we will have a very big impact on almost every industry. 
genie is already out of the bottle and WT and any university and any country, India, Pakistan, Germany, United States, Mexico, Canada, you name any country, 200 plus countries, they all have to deal with AI. So what are the areas which will be impacted? Healthcare, logistics, uh, predictive maintenance, higher education, us, forecasting, sales, automotive, finance, marketing, weather pattern, digital assistant. Everybody is impacted and we have discussed it in our classes, but uh, this is interesting. Uh, which industries are exposed to AI? And I got this data from Wall Street Journal, August 28th, uh, 29th, and this is mind boggling. The most of the places where AI is going to impact office, administrative support, legal, knowledge workers, architecture, engineering, manufacturing, life sciences, business and finance, community, management, sales and marketing, computer, mathematical area, farming. Education is in the end. Although we are going to be affected, but there are bigger industries and they will be impacted by AI. And that is kind of very interesting. So people uh, may lose job, uh, it's very possible. Although AI is not going to replace human being, both our uh, speakers uh, talked about it. So what are the major issues? That's what I'm interested in, and I'm doing research in some of the topics. Regulatory environment is getting in. So what are we doing with that? United States FTC, Federal Trade Commission, we discussed it the other day in our classes. European Commission, United Kingdom's Competition Commission, they want to regulate this industry. It's getting out of control. And there are some fights. Lots of people are involved, but lots of money is involved. How much money we are looking at? Billions of dollars. And I'm looking at some of the top companies. Cyber security is getting very involved. There are legal and copyright issues, IP issues, intellectual property. That's what Dan just mentioned. Uh, national security is a very big area. Geopolitics. Countries are going to protect themselves. They will also do things where we do not know how to protect our security. And that's a very big uh, global issue. Expert knowledge is kind kind of uh, impacted, a lot of disruptive effects. Some, some of these are visible, some of these are invisible. They are behind the scene. And this is where the problem is. Almost every day we read about AI in almost every magazine, every newspaper, Financial Times, Wall Street, New York Times, Economist. I mean, every day they are talking about it. So if you look at all the capitals, Washington, D.C., Berlin, London, okay, Mexico City, and you name any country, they are discussing these issues. Some of these are behind the scene because of national security. Some of these are open. But many businesses are involved, multinational corporations are involved. Higher education is involved. Your university, our university is involved. a and system, UT, Harvard. I mean, you name anything, uh, it is happening. So these are all disruptive impacts. And one thing which I'm always concerned, coming back from uh, the region which I uh, come to, inequality is going to be a problem. Haves and have-nots, people may lose jobs. Wages may go down, as our speakers mentioned, if you eliminate some of the industries, people may lose jobs or their salaries will go down. So this is not something we have to, you know, look at it every day. We have to deal with it. And this is where a lot of lobbying comes in. All the high-tech companies, they are very powerful. Go to Washington, D.C., you can see the lobbyists and all the other capitals of the world. So this is what we are looking at, but mostly wages and job losses. So how do we deal with that? I don't have an answer. Nobody got an answer. Uh, we have to deal with it, uh, but uh, I'm going to stop here because I want to make sure that this time we have 10 minutes. 
and we will open this uh, floor for your questions. So you have your uh, mic, and uh, then uh, if you have any question, please uh, uh, stand up, introduce yourself very quickly, your major, and then uh, you can ask our speakers or myself. Questions, comments, a lot of things are happening in the world. I'm Payne Brown. I'm a general business major right now. One question I had was, um, so since AI is a kind of threat to cybersecurity for the most part, wouldn't it be also the kind of sol the solution for it, kind of like how it already checks our work for to see if it's been plagiarized from AI and other stuff? Since you deal with political science. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that, I mean, that's a, a good question. Just about everything when you search on chat GTP will always have a little like a slug at the end that says we still need to deal with the ethical security and privacy issues and I kept thinking about that in terms of allegedly there's some programs where you can take like a student's paper and actually load it into a, a AI system of some sort of chatbot and it'll grade it for you and I kept thinking that's wonderful until that one day when I forget to take off the student's buff gold card number which is now floating out there uh, and I'll get this, oh, the university now is, was it 350,000 for each instance of releasing student identification information? Uh, whoops. Uh, maybe we should make people buy textbooks. But anyway, uh, that, uh, that becomes a, a bit of an issue. So security uh, is definitely an issue. Uh, and it's funny that you could actually probably find security leakage or security issues by using the same systems and stuff. You've seen the ads on TV about the, the, was it the home the home stealers uh, and regularly they have someone who does that where they actually he was arrested for you know taking and taking the property and putting it in his name to get like mortgages and stuff but it's really your property so the best person to ask about that is uh, someone who does that so maybe uh, we should ask AI how it broke its own security I just think it's interesting to put the machine in charge of the machine right <laughs> so yeah if there are security issues and then we're using ai to find those security issues again i'm i'm an advocate for there still needs to be some kind of human oversight to say okay i see what you're doing i see what the issue is um, that that would be my that would be my concern okay other questions comments yes sir uh, my name is ryan i'm a general business major what do y'all see uh the future looking like with ai 10, Have you seen Wally? <laughs> I I mean I so I went to WT to get my bachelor's degree in the nineties here. Yeah, it was pretty cool. We didn't have windows in this building at all. It was great. Um a lot's changed since then. As far as the future goes with writing and with classes and with textbooks and with technology. I don't know. I could see a bunch of WT buffs walk in the halls with pat, you know, like uh, iPads in front of them or a screen in front of them, and they're absorbing all of this information consistently and constantly. Um, I don't know what the output would look like, but I know what the input would look like. Just, I'm very curious myself. But I don't know. Rouse. Well, I, I've been finding on the internet different uh, different statements or different uh, I wouldn't say sayings, but comments that one of the problems that we have now is there's almost too much information you don't know who to pay attention to. And so I can, that's what I can see happening. That, and a lot of folks will say, well, I don't want to get involved in that because I don't understand all of it. Okay. That leaves more for the rest of us. Uh, and so that, that becomes a bit of a problem. Uh, when you start having 24-hour news, the problem is the news becomes devalued. And so no one, which, which story should I pay attention to? You keep playing that one you know, every 30 minutes, the same story over, that must be an important one. And the one you only play once, well, that's, that's less important. So how do you decide what to pay attention to? So too much information creates too little attention. That's correct. Okay, one last question. Yes, sir. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Stephen Hahn. I'm a general business major. My, uh, my question is with AI becoming more and more of a a versatile tool for any industry out there, how do you think that will affect the value of higher education as we go on? I'll turn that over. 
So I don't know if this will be a good enough answer, um, but in my tech comm class, I always make the argument it's the most practical writing class because you're learning how to address an issue, articulate an idea, um, create something that establishes I have this need that I need solved via you know, a proposal, report, memo, whatever, right? That's some pretty basic stuff that all industries need. But if AI starts overtaking a lot of that, my concern, especially with higher education, which in all of our standards and even in the state standards, we're supposed to teach critical thinking, teamwork, problem solving, um, community investment, those types of concepts. I don't know what that's going to look like if AI starts doing the critical thinking for us. What purpose do we then serve? Why are you here getting an education if you can just have AI do it for you? Um, so I don't know. Again, I, I like to go back to I like to have value in what I do. And I like to have value in being needed in what I do. And if AI is doing that for me, what's next, right? So I don't know. That, I don't know if that's a good enough answer or if that even addresses it. I'll let you. I have a very good friend from high school who always likes to vote for the all-star, the baseball all-stars, and she goes through and picks the players based on how she likes their uniforms. So can you have AI vote for the all-star baseball teams? Will it pick out which, you know, well, they can't have the, the light blue with the red because they, they clash. Uh, and she, that's how she does it. She'll look and she'll see the player. Oh, he plays for this, this team. Eh, I don't like their uniforms. So then he, I mean, he's the best pitcher out there. Why wouldn't you vote for, vote for him? Uh, but yeah, I, I do the voting that, you know, and talking about uh, AI voting, uh, I always tell everybody, and I probably shouldn't do this on recording, that I study all the constitutional amendments very thoroughly and I vote no on all of them. Uh, is that rational? Is that you know, but Dr. Roush, you should study all of them. It's like, well, I do. That's why I vote no on all of them. Uh, if you vote yes, it just encourages them. So the more you vote yes, you'll have to have more amendments to amend the amendments that amended the amendment. But if you vote no, you don't change anything. So it's, uh, I spend hours reading, studying all the different angles, and then I go in and, you know, no, 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 no. And in, you know, 30 seconds or less, I'm done voting while my wife is still reading the first one. So because she has to read everything. I don't think AI can ever replace my wife and myself. Okay, one. Uh, it would go nuts. If you have any question, um, anybody else? Yes, one last question over there. Uh, my name is Tori Trader, and I'm a general business major, but this is kind of more for Dr. Roush. I guess, uh, do you see in the future, since AI has uh, access to any information on the internet, do you think it could potentially in the future start making better like governmental and policy decisions than a human could? Because they could look at every government that's failed or succeeded and in turn. Um, maybe, uh, only if we let it. Uh, that's, you know, we being whoever we is, you know, individual members of a country or city or something. The, the problem is that I was in Pittsburgh in the spring, uh, right when we started getting all the rain in May. Uh, but I was in Pittsburgh, and there's a debate there about uh, they use an algorithm to determine which families, you know, if there's a like a family welfare case, which families are more likely to be able to fix that problem themselves, or which one do they have to remove the children from the home? So you have an algorithm that decides that. Shouldn't people decide that? I mean, they plug things in like what's the gender, you know, is it a single mom, is it, you know, African American, what's the income and stuff, and then at the end it'll say 30. And if it's like 25 and higher, oh, no, got to take the kid. Yeah. Uh, and so that, that I thought was very interesting. That's still working its way through the court system as well. The federal government is suing the state of Pennsylvania, Commonwealth, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania uh, for using that type of system. I, I can't see machines making better governmental decisions than, than people. They may provide the information to do it, but the actual yes or no, that really has to be a people thing. Very good. Okay, so let me uh, wrap up. Uh, very good uh, discussion. A lot of wonderful things were mentioned. But I want to make sure that this is uh, Raul Garcia. He's our president, AMA, American Marketing Association. And uh, he was elected today. <laughs> so congratulations. But uh, one last thought. Uh, AI, we teach business. 
these gentlemen, they teach writing and political science, but in business, you are always looking at transaction cost. You have to bring your cost down. This is what they are doing. Number two, we are also looking at how to be efficient and effective. That's where AI is also doing a lot of things. But then on the other hand, uh, so go behind the scene, and that is legal issues, ethical issues. I mean, everything what we discussed is good, but one last thought is, AI, in my opinion, and many people agree, and social scientists and real scientists, it's an experiment. Experiments are started and they also finish. But how long they will stay, we don't know. So this is like an experiment. It's going nationwide, worldwide. We have to wait and see. So that's why we have a one more seminar in the making, and we will have it next semester or by the end of this uh, semester. And uh, because there are so many changes happening almost every day, so we have to redo it one more time and to see that what are the things happening and what may lie ahead. But stakes are very high. So don't take it very lightly. Please uh, do pay attention because human beings are not going anywhere. Human beings are not going anywhere. We will still be here. But of course, machines may take over. You never know. But all the best. Thank you so much, sir, for your uh, time. And thank you again. And let's give a hand to our speaker. <laughs>